All right, so we are recording. Uh, thank you all for coming. This is uh, the first listening post session that we're doing. Um, I am Kellick, I'm the Earl Marshal of the Middle Kingdom, and I'm joined today by uh, Master Isabel, Master Darius, the outgoing Kingdom uh, Earl Mar uh, Kingdom Rapier Marshal, mirrored by the incoming Kingdom Rapier Marshal. Um, and we are here, really, the idea is we want to try to get feedback to see, uh, I, I think it's, uh, a wise thing to ask people what they think to try to get feedback. Um, I don't think that any any one of the people here have all of the answers or have the the full picture. So if we we ask around, we can hopefully get a better picture, get a clear image, and uh, find things where we can try to make things better. Uh, so that's uh, what I have. Um, uh, Isabel, would you like to give a brief introduction? Um, I'm Isabel Taylor, the clerk of the roster, and uh, my main function is to uh, keep the database updated with all of the current authorizations. Great. Uh, Darius? Hi, I'm Master Darius. I was the Kingdom Reaper Marshal for the last, I don't remember how many years, I am being replaced by Mirabai. Uh, she'll do a great job, and I will soon be irrelevant. You will never be irrelevant. Uh, you are always uh, steadfast and a good person. Uh, Mirabai, you're up. Um, I am Maestro Mirabai. I am the new KRM as of Crown Tournament. And I'm looking forward to seeing what we can create in the next couple of years. Great. OK, so those are our basic introductions. This is really us being here for, for all of you. Uh, if, if we, so I want to open up to see if anybody has any questions right off the bat. If not, I do have a couple of questions for people too. So uh, if you have a question, go ahead and, and uh, shout it out or raise your hand or, or something like that. I have a question. Okay. Um, so I recently heard from a different marshal in a different group that it was uh, their opinion that if there were, um, that they always had to have a marshal at practices always watching the fights. So if it was just him and like two other fencers, he could never fight because he was the only marshal and he had to always be watching. Or if it was him and one other fencer, they couldn't ever do full speed fights at their practices. And that is not how we have ever run our practices. Um, we've always wanted to make sure that there was barriers between us and, you know, other people around and making sure people were watching and paying attention. But if there's only one marshal at practice, they could still participate. They just had to make sure that somebody was still watching for like safety issues and people around them and stuff like that. But like that didn't necessarily have to be the only marshal. They could still participate in practice and fight. But like we didn't really know clearly in the rules on which side of this, I don't know, can you clarify that? I so know. so <laughs> ideally, we would always have a marshal to watch us fight, right? Um, and that is what the rules are geared towards. However, there are a number of small practices around the kingdom that only have a few rapier fighters. So the bare minimum that you should have is a third party watching you fight for safety, right? If we're at a practice, um, you know, and, and people are struggling with calling shots, that's something that you and your opponent can discuss, but you need someone to make sure that you're not about to trip over something, you're not about to run into someone, you're not putting yourself or others in an unsafe position. So if there are only two fighters, great, those fighters can fight, but they still need a third person watching to make sure that they are not um, putting themselves or others in danger by just moving around and what they're doing. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's kind of what we thought. Okay. Well, I'd like to clarify a step beyond that on the two fighter thing, because here in Loch Murrow for the last mm, half dozen years or so, about 25% of our practices are me and the one other guy that shows up. No one else ever. Um, that's been going on here for off and on forever, but consistently uh, for a quarter of our practices for the last at least five years. Uh, in fact, as I told uh, Kellogg when we started, it wasn't supposed to be a practice, but or it was supposed to be a practice tonight, but no one showed up because that happens about 20% of the time also. Um, I understand that situation. Um, and 
I know that there are some people who are put in that difficult position where there are only a couple people who come to a practice. I would greatly prefer if there was a third person to watch and make sure that you are not about to fall or run into something. However, if you are literally the only two humans there, the likelihood that you're going to be running into other people and injuring them is obviously nil. Um, but my strong preference would still be for there to be a third person, if at all possible, to watch for safety. I think that's a great answer. And I, I completely agree with what she's saying. Um, we're, we're all adults and you we're assuming some kind of risk. So even if you have a third person there, you could still trip over something. So just really use your, your best common sense, use your best judgment uh, and try to be safe. Thank you. Okay, who's next? Okay, well, everyone knows Ish isn't very good about being quiet. Um, is there some place that's easy to locate a list of all the experiments that are still current um, in the kingdom? I think that there is not. Um, I don't think we have a, a good uh, list of that. And that's something I'm, I'm making uh, notes on things that we should try to do. Uh, so no, there is not a, a convenient list, uh, but we should try to put one together. There's not a convenient list, but there's only three, I believe, currently. Um, grappling is still technically an experiment because the society has not pressed it forward. Um, the non-metal weapons uh, cut and thrust experiment and reduced armor. And then there's a minor experiment of trying out some 3D printed spearheads. But that's not open for everyone. That's a testing purposes only currently. Right. And that's the exact kind of concept that I was looking for because I heard something about that experiment on the spearheads, but not how it was working. And going back, I wasn't sure where the status was on grappling. Um, and, That's uh, something that we've asked society about, and society still owes us some answers on how they want to conduct that or continue to conduct that. Uh, generally, most of these things are supposed to have a six-month to two-year time period on them, and since they didn't want to incorporate um, that into the society rules, they kind of just have let it continue on, but they haven't given us any direction about it even when specifically asked so far. Thank you. And that's one of the things that I'm working on both. Um, Kelly and I are going to work on making things more transparent via the website, making sure that there are places where people can easily access information like that. And I'm also working on establishing um, more consistent communication with the SRM, or at least I'm trying to. <laughs> Good luck. I think that the, Mirabai brings up an excellent point. The, the Middle Kingdom is, I think, the, the most populous kingdom in the known world. Uh, and we don't communicate our, our thoughts or our preferences to the, the society level officers or board of directors often. Uh, and I would encourage all of you to, to do that uh, as often as, as you can. Let them know how things are. Uh, they make decisions that, that affect us, and we should have some kind of say in that. Uh, that's my, my soapbox for, for the moment. Um, who else has a question? Uh, I just wanted to follow up on Isha's question. Uh, so I know I'd sent y'all uh, a document about grappling particular a week and a half ago. Uh, if we're still waiting uh, for society to get back to us at some indefinite point, uh, would it, and I don't want, I don't want to put y'all on the spot, so feel free to be like, I'll think about it and have an answer to you soon. Uh, would it be possible uh, to, at least in our own kingdom, move grappling to the point where we can, even if it's not an official thing, uh, conduct it inside of tournaments? So that's a, a fair point. Um, I don't know the, the layout of how the experiment was set up, if we could modify the, the terms of the experiment. Darius, are you familiar with, could we modify that? Is that even possible? Um, it's been a long time since I've read the official letter of it uh, before, because it wasn't an official uh, item. It wasn't permitted to be used in tournaments. Um, 
that which is part of why it was highlighted for um, its own kind of activities and for charity kind of things. Um, but I think at least there used to be some societal wording that if it wasn't an official uh, activity, it could not be used for tournament combat. I don't I will, know where that stands currently. We can look into it. I was going to say, I will look into the exact wording on that because I, I understand the desire to move forward with that. You've been waiting a long time. Um, if I can't find anything that directly contravenes it, um, I would be okay with it as long as it's made very obvious from the get-go, this is going to be included in this tournament and anyone who doesn't feel comfortable with that should not participate in that tournament. Um, but I will look into the, the society wording and make sure that that doesn't contravene anything. Wonderful, great to hear, thank you so much. If you don't hear back, let me know. Uh, I'm gonna try to have another meeting with the society marshal uh, next month and I'll, I'll ask him. Um, you can try to kick it up to that level too. Uh, Adam, you had your hand up or your, your virtual hand up. So what you got? <laughs> um, status of the new Marshall's exam. Nearby? Well, so I finished writing the exam quite a while ago and um, kicked it up the chain, but have not heard anything since we've gotten a new KEM. So what is the status as far as it being approved and available? I know that Darius made it available to some people just sort of as a test run. But no, what is it was the released live into Facebook land and it's open and available, or at least it was. Okay. Well, hey, I'm the KEM and uh, you haven't heard back from my office. Uh, you're able to use it. I'm totally good with it. Perfect. Then it's usable. Um, I will make sure that links are posted to... Um, all the the usual groups um i'll try and do that tomorrow can you give a, a bit of a uh discussion about what it is yeah so um i for those of you who don't know i'm i'm a teacher so i have a background in using uh, google apps for education and so i made the offer to create a new marshall's test based on the most recent edition of the rules using google forms um so it's I can't remember anymore because it was a while ago when I finished it. I believe it's less than 40 questions and it covers sort of all the different facets of marshalling. And um, we've had a few people take it and gotten some feedback and changed a few things on it. But um, basically it's designed to be an open book, you know, not pass fail, just um, kind of show us what you know and what you still need help with as a marshal um, at this point. I don't believe that it has been used with any brand new marshals yet, has it? One or two brand new marshals have taken. It's just shy of 30 questions. It's like 29 or 28. That's why uh, we cut it down, okay. Yeah, and part of the information that we can gather from that test is that we can see the individual answers of who answered and, and did each test. So we can see, you know, hey, you only got 10 questions right we need to discuss some things with you and get this figured out before we can have you be a marshal. So then we can, we have targeted topics. We can see which questions are not being answered in the way that we expected them to, to see if it's a, a question problem or if it's uh, an information or something else issue. Uh, and we can also see which ones are good or bad so that we can address them with the greater populace and or work on the questions, work on the wording, do round tables, have some continuing education about them. Um, yeah, the, the thinking behind the creation of the new test was um, multifaceted, but two of the big points were, we wanna move away from the old style of you either pass the test or you fail the test to more of a, um, we're gauging progress and what not only a marshal might need to be further educated in, but what we need to work on as a community of marshals in educating others. Um, so more of as a, as a, as a progress point rather than an end point. And the other part of it was to fix the test from previous versions where there were lots of questions that didn't have a clear answer to a test where it's not vague, it's based directly on the rules that are, you know, open to everyone to read in the Marshall's handbook um, or in the rule book and that it's very clear what you know and what you don't know based on on your answers on the test 
Okay, uh, on a follow up from that, uh, Cope put in the comments, can we also post a link in the pail? Um, I guess that's a, a question we should have a conversation around about. Right now, I know we put it up on Facebook for, for uh, people to, to kind of test it out. Um, is that something that we want to have readily available that people can go? I mean, I, I don't know that I see a problem with people taking the test multiple times, but do we want to have any kind of control over that? Um, I don't think there's any need for control because it's not like a, you know, I'm going to copy your answers kind of test, like it's open book for everyone to take. Um, it is set up to collect email addresses, so it will show if someone has taken it multiple times. Um, and you know, we will see all of the answers. So if there's someone who pops in there and takes it a dozen times, I will contact them and say, hey, what's going on? Um, but I don't, I don't see any problem with it being available for anyone to take. Now, with the understanding that just because you get the answers right on the test does not automatically make you a marshal. <laughs> There's there's other facets to it. That's true. And also as a point on that, if you are doing the MIT process and you come and say, hey, I finished it. Oh, here's my cat. He wanted to come up and say hi. Uh, if you um, if you take the, the test and you finish it, uh, there's kind of a, a process. You need to finish the MIT process and then take the test. Um, so I guess if you finish it, take the test first, we might ask you to take it again, or maybe we'll just go with that. I don't know. We're pretty flexible. Uh, and Cope had a follow up. She says, uh, I find it hard to follow rule changes and would love to see the pale use. That's just her. Uh, I think that that's good. Uh, the pale is, is an important uh, tool. Um, I don't know how many people use the pale, though, as much anymore. So we need to be the pale is one tool. We also need to publish things in, in a variety of other places. Uh, a nominator points out that Facebook eats posts as well, which is true. They do. Uh, the best place for it to be would probably be the, the Kingdom Facebook page or not Kingdom Facebook page, the Kingdom web page. Um, and that has uh, a little bit of problems with trying to get stuff updated on there too. So we are still trying to work on a solution. I would like to see things posted to the Kingdom webpage, um, possibly in the pale and also um, pinned posts for groups don't tend to disappear. So um, since I was made an admin for the Rapier Marshals group, if there are any rule changes that come up or any major concerns for the community, I will make a pinned post for them so that they will be easy to find at the top of the page. Uh, I have seen Roland have his hand up for a little while. So Roland, if you want to unmute, you can go ahead and ask your question. Okay. Um, Kellick, you kind of already answered it, but I just want to get some clarity before I uh, put my hand back down. As far as MITs are concerned, uh, people who are in the process of doing their martial and training and do not have all of their signatures yet for all of the events they need to work, it's perfectly okay if they take the test before they finish all their signatures. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And then of course, if, if with this new test, since we get much better feedback, you know, if we can talk with them, work with them, they take it again, you know, whatever like that. Um, so at what point in time do we kind of, or is this really just left up to the regionals? At what point in time do we give up on somebody like, dude, you're just not getting it. I don't like the idea of ever giving up on anybody ever. Okay. Um, Great words, Your Grace. Oh, Received I, and understood. Uh, we should not give up on people. Um, people might take a longer time to get through a process. Um, and if somebody is, is having a, uh, the, the test is great. The online test, I really like it. And that appeals to me and how I take tests. Um, if somebody has a problem taking tests, uh, I don't want to speak for Mirabai, but I'm, Pretty sure as a teacher, she's cool with people taking tests in alternative ways too. I know she has to make allowances for, for people. There's not one way. Our goal isn't, uh, we don't need people to, to be the best test takers. We need people to, to be good marshals. And that doesn't necessarily mean you have to take a test. Okay, gotcha. Um, we have a follow-up question in here from Marie Le Falconer. Uh, what are the expectations in regard to this test for people who are already warranted marshals? That's something that I'm going to be discussing with Kellick. Um, we have been talking for quite a while about the idea of continuing education for marshals. And I would like to see that every time there's a new edition of the rules put out, not necessarily a single rule change, but a new edition of the rules put out, that all marshals take a test that is updated to those rules. Um, mostly to just ensure that everyone is reading and understanding those new rules. Um, we've had major issues for years now of marshals who are quoting rules that are no longer 
valid to people when doing inspections or doing authorizations. Um, so this would help to alleviate that. And I know that there are some people who are going to be unhappy with the idea of having to test to continue their marshal it. Um, there was a time when we were very short on marshals and we needed everyone possible to be a marshal. But if there's an individual who feels that it's not worth their time or effort to you know, spend 20 to 30 minutes taking a test every year and a half or two years when new rules come out, then their marshal it, you know, they don't need to have their, their marshal it. They can just go back to being a fencer and enjoying doing what they do. I think that's a solid answer. I support that. Um, uh, Cope says she loves the idea of taking the test. Uh, Marie says, got it, thank you. Adam says plus one for creating a continuing education plan. Uh, from the uh, phone, um, we have how many different rapier marshal Facebook pages are there? I want to promote rapier participation at my Baronese event. Where do I advertise? Um, so there's a Mid Realm Rapier Marshals page, and um, there's also the <laughs> the Rapier Social Club, um, which started as a very unofficial thing, and it's sort of become the place to post about rapier stuff. Um, those would be the two major places besides just the, the Middle Kingdom Facebook page that I would promote anything for Rapier. Some of the regional groups also have their own Marshalls page, um, but they're not as heavily used and it's usually a repost of items from other pages. Okay, so I'm going to take a moment and ask one of my questions. Um, this is a question more for the, the audience. Uh, one of the things that we want to try to do is find who are which marshal are doing things especially well and see what they're doing so we can try to spread that out to more people so is there a a marshal that you feel has that does uh inspections particularly well uh so in in my barony are the usual marshal in our practices uh I don't know his full name, but he goes by Bartholomew. Um, he's he's very much a stickler for the rules. He makes sure that we're filling out the proper forms every single time for the participation, any of the waivers and stuff. Um, he's he's usually on point, and he's got a couple marshal and or at least one that I know of a marshal in training, and um, making that person do you know the proper inspections, make sure everything's up to point so he's been he's been excellent as far as i've seen what group is that in shatter crystal thank you yeah anybody else um if i may maybe to change the question slightly what do you think makes for a good inspection anyone so i when... think Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> sure, I'll go. Um, uh, one of the things that I try to make a point of asking with my uh, inspections of other people is um, to uh, call out, ask them to call out anything new with their armor recently and uh, make them explicitly say that they are comfortable fighting in their gear. Um, I think both of those are an opportunity to uh, re-engage with the fighter in a way that um, stand here, turn, spin, let me look at your swords, let me look at the inside of your mask, off you go, the end. Uh, it, that's a very passive uh, uh, interaction, and I want to get the um, fighter to um, add some clarity to what it is that they're bringing onto the list field. That's a good point. Uh, I know some other people had some comments, but I didn't see where it was all flashing. So who else has something? Okay. Um, so I've been through a handful of inspections of different people, uh, um, some of the present company included. Um, I know where there have been some when they do inspections and stuff, you know, they just kind of make sure that the sword isn't, you know, there aren't any nicks or anything that can cut or, um, or skin them. Um, I've had one where like they really tested, make sure that my tape job on the tip of the sword, you know, is really, really strong. I mean, they're pulling on that sucker. With, and you know what? Yeah, it's a pain in the butt if they pull it off and I have to re-tape it, but I would rather them do that instead of it hurting somebody. 
Um, you know, anytime I've introduced any new gear, I, you know, when I tell them uh, much to what Adam had said, you know, they'll ask me, well, has it been punch tested? And, you know, how do you feel about it? And I'm like, you know, yeah, I've punch tested as soon as I got it and I feel really good about it. So um, I, as far as what they, I mean, as far as what they do, I just really think that, you know, we have the rules and as long as they're adhering to the rules and doing everything the way they, they should, I think that's a, a real big plus for us. Okay. Does anybody else have any thoughts on this question? One of the things to, to expand on what Adam was saying, um, I actually started doing this back when I was a heavy marshal. I ask a person, has anything recently been repaired on your armor? And then what is there anything that needs to be repaired? Trying to make make the fencers more aware of their equipment. I like those questions. Thank you, Terrence. Uh, anybody else? Okay, I do have another question, but uh, does anybody have any, anybody else have a question? Um, I do. So I have a, a local fencer who was a marshal before the pandemic, and he just asked at the last practice, um, how does he renew his marshalette if it lapsed? Does he have to restart over with the MIT paperwork, or how does he get that back going? So um, go on, go ahead. you answer this one. I So my understanding was that um, anyone who was a marshal in good standing prior to the pandemic continues to be a marshal in good standing unless they feel that they need to, um, I guess, get some continuing education and, and retest. Okay, so just the requirement of, you know, having to do quarter four marshal reports is renewing this year. Yes. Okay. I, yeah, I would check the database to see if their list is a marshal there, uh, make okay. sure that they have a waiver on file, make sure they have a membership, and make sure that they are aware and up to speed on the newest version of the rules. Okay. Um, because some of that did release in the limbo of pandemic. But otherwise, if they showed reasonable skill to pay attention and uh, exercise caution in the rule set, then there shouldn't be a reason to uh, penalize them for what the world happened to. Okay, great. And then speaking of quarter four, I'm realizing it's the end of October. That's due in like a week, isn't it? Yep. November 1st, we should be filling those out. <laughs> yep. Okay. Okay. Right. I didn't realize it was quite that soon. Um, we want to try to move away from the services portal. Mirabai, how do you feel about trying to make a, a reporting form for Rapier for by next week? Um, <laughs> <What>? <laughs> no pressure. I no pressure. Yeah, no pressure. Sure. Okay, if you can do that, if you can make one it, uh, bare bones, then we don't have to do the services portal. I, it's going to depend largely on the uh, internet connectivity at uh, the farm this weekend. So, but I will try. Okay. Great, sorry for putting you on the spot there. Um, I thought we had more time. Well, part of that is because Rapier reports a month off of Rattan. Yeah, Armored is December 1st and we're November 1st. I knew the armored one. We could just move Rapier to December 1st. Oh, now that we, is the most we? brilliant idea I've heard. <laughs> we can't because of society. Oh. Currently. Uh, never mind. Take it back. That's too bad. Uh, is is the services portal currently working? Because at Q3 reports, <laughs> it was not off. It depends. Um, you know, I... I honestly don't, I, I'm not on the team to, to monitor whether that's up or not. Um, I know that we got the, the go ahead from Curia, uh, I think at the last Curia meeting to move away from the services portal. So we want to, to try to do that as, as quickly as we can. Um, uh, I think that the service portal was, was good, but I think that a lot of people had problems with it. So we wanna to try to make it as easy for people to report and, and be in compliance as we can. 
and the services portal does still kind of work, but it's really in a kind of situation. So some people use it, they believe they've reported, and yeah, there's some issues there that I have heard. Uh, Adam made a comment that could we set up an experiment to change the reporting schedule? And he says he's only half joking. I don't think that's the kind of experiment that the society wants to try to do. Um, but it's a, a great idea. I like your thinking outside the box. Um, um, if you do make the Google Forms reporting, which, which I think would be awesome, can you make sure that the link is on like the MidRealm Library of Documents Rapier page or whatever so that it's easily accessible? I will guarantee that I will send it to the, the web team. I can't guarantee that they will put it up there in a timely fashion, unfortunately. Okay. They've been pretty good. I put in some changes yesterday and I put them in uh, yesterday or today. So they- Okay. That's great. I know that that's been an, an issue in the past, so. Okay, uh, who else has a question? All right, I am not seeing any hands, so I'll go ahead and my other question is, uh, is um, we've all had to go through an authorization. Is there somebody who ran a particularly good authorization for you? Uh, and I think I'll, I'll go with Mirabai's also, after we ask that, we'll shift into what makes a good authorization. Sadly, I can only remember the people I thought ran bad authorizations. The good authorization just goes through and it doesn't stick in the memory for me. Sure. Okay. Um, but so we, it sounds like that might be the case for most people. So what would be, what makes up a good uh, authorization in, in your mind? Uh, one of the tools I've found helpful in authorizations is empowering fighters to be able to call hold. Uh, so not like right doing something to cause that. So like like still being safe, but like holding onto their sword for too long, uh, or anything like that variety. Uh, just to make sure that like people who are at those newer levels can make sure to vocalize that they need the situation to cease and like be safe, regardless of like if they're fighting whatever big mucky muck. I think that's a solid point and we should all feel comfortable calling hold anytime that the situation is unsafe. That's a, an excellent reminder for everyone. Uh, Roland, you had a comment? Um, I actually just wanted to ask uh, maybe for not necessarily clarification, but consensus concerning the, the Perry device authorization in Rapier, but I can hold that until after uh, the conversation about what makes a good authorization, if that's preferable. We'll, we'll circle back to that then. Aisha, did you have a comment on this? I did. Um, I think what makes a good authorization is incredibly dependent, not on the marshals involved in the process, but on the person they choose as the opponent. Um, that is to me, the most crucial thing of an authorization. And we need to be properly choosing the people who are fighting as auth partners uh, sometimes we don't get as good of options as we would like, and uh, but I think that needs to be stressed to all the marshal, especially the new marshals, that picking your opponent for a, an authorization that can press, that can not press, that can leave openings and do all those proper things makes the authorization or breaks it, and that's only indirectly controlled by the marshal, and the marshal needs to exert the best indirect control they can for that. That's it. I, I absolutely agree with the, the choosing the right opponent. And I also want marshals to be aware that if they're running an authorization, they can you know, have the person who's authorizing stand off to the side for a minute and say to their opponent, hey, I really need you to, to press them in this next pass. Um, so it can be both indirectly and directly guided by the marshals. Uh, yes, 100%. Um, Anything else, Ish? Real briefly, uh, what makes a bad authorization to me is too focused, too precise of questions and answers expected from them. Uh, going back to, we've got a, you know, a new Marshall's test with good questions and things like that. Um, I watched an authorization where the fighter was just struggling 
for what the answer the marshal was looking for. It was how far, um, it was actually an armored authorization, but it doesn't matter. Uh, he, he asked, you know, how far above the knee and the fighter was pointing to the exact right spot, but didn't know the question that was, you know, he wanted him to hear to say the words an inch above the knee. And instead he was just pointing to that spot. And going back to, you know, testing and we're not teachers and we're not professionals and things like that, but going too much in depth or expecting too much out of the questions and answers. And it, you know, can get tedious, frustrating to people, especially if they're a little on the neurodivergent scale. 100%. I also, but I also firmly believe that authorizations are a check of safety, not a check of skill. Um, and it's not a chance to catch someone out in not knowing a, a minor detail. It's a chance to make sure that they are completely safe. And it's a chance to maybe educate them about some details that they aren't quite clear on, um, something that is not a safety factor. Um, speaking of Think something that can go wrong. I know one person, um, this was admittedly 10 years ago, so this is maybe not uh, an issue anymore, who um, failed his authorization because the marshal asked if he had read the rules and he had not because he was severely dyslexic and did not read well, but he had understood all the rules and had gone through all the rules with at local practices and had someone like work with him. So he understood all of the rules, but because he had not read them himself, he failed the authorization because person was under the impression that every new fighter was required to read the rules. Anyway, so in being inclusive, remember that you don't always ask them if you've read the rules or, you know, but you can also say like, has someone gone through all the rules with you or something? If that's ever an issue. Again, this is a very like one instance 10 years ago. I don't know how often this comes up. But just and, and it, it might have been the same instance. I don't know, but I'd heard of it too. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that call out. I agree with you. I think we should be more inclusive. Uh, Torco, you've had your hand up for a bit. Uh, what What do you have? So, taking a, doing an authorization is taking a test, and people tend to get really nervous, um, and then they they don't think properly, and it's all weird for them. And so, a thing that I like to do as much as I can is put them at ease. You know, and I tell them, look, we're not here to judge how well you fence. We just want you to be safe. And and I try to be, I don't know, calming and kind while I'm doing it. Now, I've had I've failed people before. Um, but, you know, understanding, hey, this is a stressful situation. It's going to be more stressful than going to a tournament or whatever because of how humans relate to tests. I think that's a thing that that should be kept in mind. Yep, that's true. Uh, Adam, did you have any comments? Uh, the one thing I wanted to add is uh, a good authorization has a um, marshal who is aware of time and is aware of how to manage that time. I have watched um, bad authorizations that last 30 and 45 and close to an hour of time. Um, a good authorization does not need to take a long time. A, a good marshal is focused on what do they need to see? Have they seen it? And therefore, can we move on? Or I've seen proof that the uh, candidate doesn't have the thing they need, and therefore I can stop the authorization now. Um, both of those things, um, the lead marshal needs to be aware of and focused on, not just how long can we fight in July heat before the tournament even begins. Right. In, in my opinion, um, an initial authorization shouldn't take more than 15 minutes and a secondary shouldn't take more than five. That should be enough time for a well-versed marshal to see what they need to see to determine if the person is safe or not. I, I like that timing. That, that That's an excellent sense of time. Yeah, I would agree. Ish, did you have another point or is your hand just still left up? Sorry, no, forgot to lower the hand. No worries. Does anybody else have any comments on what makes a good authorization? Okay, I'm gonna take that as a no. Uh, Roland, um, I know you said you had a question about uh, Perry's and can you go ahead and give us your question? Okay, yeah. and. 
Thank you, Mirabai, for providing those sort of rough estimates on time that uh, an authorization should take, which actually dovetails pretty well into my question. The PERI device authorization that we have in Rapier uh, sometimes takes forever. Uh, I've had some marshals who adamantly believe that in that authorization that the person authorizing has to fight with a rigid parry device, a non-rigid parry device, and a shield of some sort or kind. Um, I'm really just kind of looking for some direction and some consensus on that from the uh, the kingdom level officers here. How do you feel about that? I'm I'm going to answer, and then Kellick, if you agree, disagree with my my thoughts, feel free to jump in. Um, so parry auth is by its nature a secondary auth, right? So I would say for a person who is ready for this off, you shouldn't need more than three passes with each of those items to tell whether they are safe with it. Skill doesn't matter, safety is all that matters. Um, now, that being said, I, I will say that with a grain of salt because um, I know that I can have a single pass that lasts for seven minutes, so. Uh, okay. On the, on the, the average, pass doesn't right? Have to in a victory per se. <laughs> right. So, so yeah, um, I would say approximately three passes with, with each device, but if there's one pass that goes a long time, but it's safe, the marshal can stop them and go, okay, you're safe. Move on to the next thing. I have no issue with that answer. I think it's solid. Nearby smart and makes good answers. Uh, Ishi had something to say. Yeah. Um, why do we need to see all three devices when there can be so much variation and within those devices in general. I mean, there can be such huge differences between shields that we don't want to see them with so, a giant Rotella and a tiny buckler, et cetera. So the thinking on that is that it's a happy medium. Um, we don't want the parry auth to be done with a single parry device because that doesn't really show skill across devices, but we also can't require everyone to fight with every size shape possibility for all of those. So requiring one of each of those three categories is kind of a happy medium for that. Okay, I think I will just make a statement. I think it's a little unnecessary because of the, the differences in other things are bigger in some respects in my mind than the difference, especially between a rigid parry and a shield. Uh, your shield size differences are to me more different than your those two different items because a small rigid parry device and a small buckler work almost the same way, but a giant shield works totally different. My understanding of this is in our, in Penamir, we've always tested as rigid parry a small shield or buckler of some kind and a soft parry, generally a cloak, because that's the one that actually takes some skill. And so those are the two main ones we we test with. We don't test, um, like maybe we'd ask for someone to use a cane if they're planning to use one soon, but like those are typically the, the two we use in, in the parry authorization. Yeah, typically there's something held in a single hand, something used as a flat parry device and something used as a cloth parry. Uh, in that we're watching for the safety of the snap reaction of not hitting someone with the one-handed item. That's part right. of what that, was, that is supposed to look for. It, it was this increasing look for three that I was, uh, I'd seen a lot of lately and I thought was redundant. So I don't know that I would specifically force three. I think the three is a good idea, but you're going to have a pretty good idea of what the person is going to do safely with the other two items if there's any great concern then sure find the third item and have them use it but if you're having that level of questioning of their competency and safety at that level then you might want to have them retry the authorization after some other training even work with them that day and try it again later in the day okay any other thoughts on this question on this topic uh, it's slightly, and if this is too much of a history lesson, we don't have to answer this, but why did the soft parry and hard parry authorizations get combined? Because pretty much every marshal I talk to is like, they're two completely separate things. I don't understand why they're one authorization. We just have to run them both at once. Does, does anybody here actually know the answer to this? I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this. Okay. We needed space on the authorization cards when they were still physical cards. Hmm. 
That's Thank you for telling that story. And uh, it, that makes sense. And it's sad, but it makes sense now. Yeah. And there was some combination like on the society level of when they were still trying to tell us somewhat of what authorizations there should be, whether parries could be combined or not. And then uh, a bunch of places are just like, we're combining them. There's no reason to have separate. And then I think there was a physical space on the card issue. And there was some other social things that happened around the same time. So <laughs> whether that's specifically the answer or not, that's the one I always liked to, and thought was the, the core reason. Does it make any sense to separate them again? Because then we won't have this issue of having to run multiple different types of parry devices in a single parry authorization. Like if someone wants to use a buckler, you just run a hard parry authorization. Or is this like too complicated and it's not worth going through all the administrative hoops to separate them? I don't know. Or maybe nobody else wants them separated. I just, I don't know. I can I see a point for separating them, but also it's been one of those things that most people that wanted one didn't really care if they took three minutes and did the authorization for the other one and just got it done. Um, so they weren't really being done separately when they were separate for the most part. So functionally, it didn't make a huge difference. And I, I think this is sort of what, what Darius was saying earlier about the you know two versus three devices. Um, as the marshal running the authorization, kind of use your best judgment with the with the person. Um, obviously, ideally, they will be using what they intend to use on the field. Um, but you know, if if you feel that there's a skill they haven't demonstrated, have them do it with, you know, another device. Um, but I think that having a, a soft parry and a hard parry used for a few passes shouldn't take very much time and shouldn't be a huge stress on anyone. Thomas, did you have a uh, comment on this? Yeah, I was. <clears throat> I haven't experienced it personally, but I've been told that before pandemic, there were a number of times that uh, marshals were being asked, "Hey, I'm a complete disaster with a cloak. I don't ever even want to try to authorize with it, but I really want to get a buckler for Penzik. So can I get the combined uh, authorization if I just promise never to use the soft that I'm a disaster with?" And I'm, I didn't like that answer, that question, because it's like, no, you're getting a license for all these different kinds of things. So you need to be able to not be a disaster with them. And they were lamenting the fact that we had combined them and they couldn't just get a buckler only off. So I guess the question is, it looks like the consensus is, no, you got to prove you're safe with it, even if you never use it. So here's the thing um, that strikes me for this is that there are often, well, I shouldn't say often, there are sometimes... Um, tournaments or events that require the use of a soft parry. So better to show that you can use it for a few passes. Um, again, obviously we're not looking for skill, we're just looking for safety. So right. when someone says they're a disaster with a cloak, usually what that means is I'm no good with it, I always lose. Okay, I don't <laughs> yeah. care. As long as you're not throwing it over someone's head, binding up their blade and pulling it out of their hand, as long as you are safe, great. Okay. That's a good answer. Uh, Adam, did you have a comment on this as well? Uh, I did uh, really briefly and, and uh, with, I don't wanna derail this. So it's okay if I just get shut down or if we talk about it in more detail later, but it, if we're looking at advanced authorizations and we're looking at how many possible uh, permutations of advanced authorizations we could create, um, the alternative is to acknowledge uh, that there is single sword and then there is all of the things and we could set we could go as extreme as there are two aughts um, basic and advanced and it is up to you the fencer to recognize whether you are uh, appropriately skilled in being able to do the thing um, that is has been done in the past in other kingdoms we've never done it here um, and a little bit for good reason because of our size um, but uh, then we also have rapier melee and we don't necessarily practice it a whole lot until we come to Pentic and then we expect everybody is going to be medium to advanced capable of doing those sorts of things um, it is it is a possibility I don't know that it's a good one but it's a possibility we could consider in that regard i would love to have more of that discussion but i don't think that's good for right now <laughs> agreed okay that works for me uh sorry adam we're shutting you down is that good we did i'm good with that 
<laughs> um, real quick, I was going to post a link to the rape your marshals test um, in the chat for anyone who's interested. I will also post it to the the relevant Facebook groups and try to get it up on the website. But here it is for anyone who wants it. Except that it won't paste. Okay. The, the chat, uh, Roland also said if they uh, were separated, meaning rigid and non pair rigid, he thinks that very few would get the non rigid off. So that's just a, a point of. Uh, if, well, if I may, real quick, um, <clears throat> kind of to what Roland had, had said, um, I know with my authorization for the, <clears throat> for the Perry device, um, I know that I would have liked more opportunity to practice with a cloak. I didn't even have an opportunity to practice with a cloak. And then it was just kind of, uh, go grab a cloak. So I had to go borrow somebody's to try to do it. How I passed, I don't know. I did. But it was just one of those things. It's like, as it was said, it's a skill thing. And it's a skill kind of uh, practice. So I would really, I really would have liked more opportunities that, or maybe have it have its own authorization to where I could practice it and get good at it to where I could feel comfortable being safe about it. Cause I think practice and skill does make safer uh, fighters. To that point, I would say that your local marshals at your local practice should have had you practicing that before sending you to get that authorization at an event. I know our group has loner cloaks in our rapier gear. And also just, I mean, people have cloaks, like they're a piece of common piece of clothing. So if you, anyway. Yeah, you should have had a heads up about it. I, I definitely see your point, but you also should have had a heads up about it. Um, maybe we need to make sure that it's more widely known or more, you know, better understood that um, a Perry authorization does include both. Yep, that seems to be a takeaway I have from here too. Uh, Mirabai, can you check the link? William Morris says he's unable to get the link to work. Just saw that, let me figure out what's going on. Okay, uh, Marie, did you have a question? I do, um, not directly related to the, the authorization. So if we're not done with that topic, I'll, I'll hold back. I think that we are ready to move on. Okay, um, this, this is, bouncing off a comment made earlier and a lot of us had um laminated cards with our auths made before the great pause and i have seen comments since that have led me to believe that those may not be acceptable anymore i don't know about anybody else i sure didn't change my auths while i was gone are those cards still acceptable as proof of of authorization so I know that uh, Vincenzo has been making new cards and I, I explicitly told him that I was okay with those cards. So a physical card is, is fine. Um, the, with the, the caveat that if a, a person at the list table doesn't trust your card, which we're a society of trust, I get that. Uh, but if a, a list table might wanna look it up in the database if they, if they feel that there's something sketchy with your card. Um, I can't see somebody going to the trouble of forging a card to get onto the list because it's pretty easy to authorize, but uh, that's my caveat that if uh, the final authority is in the, the authorization database, not your, your authorization card. Sure. All right. Thank you. Yep. I print off. I actually have a, a screenshot of the, of my authorization on my phone so that I can take it there. I have uh, that and I have my wife's too, because that's what I do. Um, any other questions or thoughts? Okay. Is there anything that, so, uh, that I'm um, sorry, go on there by. So when I click on the link, it's sending me to a page and then spinning and spinning and spinning. So my guess is that something's going on with Google forms. Um, I'm going to try it with the unshortened okay. URL just real quick on my own computer. But my guess is that something's down with Google forms. Okay. So, um, are, are there things that are going particularly well or particularly poorly with Raper that you would like to, to see changed or in, uh, encouraged? Okay. Um, okay. You know, you know, you know, you know, I'd want to talk more, Kelly. Come on. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's let's talk briefly about the concept of uh, encouraging rapier versus versus cut and thrust. Uh, in some in some places, cut and thrust has been 
very separated from rapier and in others it's been very integrated um and uh oh i see copus is asking the same thing uh i mean i strongly encourage all kinds of cut and thrust because i'm in love with it uh and uh so you know are we going to keep it so it's very tightly tied together even though you can do one without the other um because uh, i know a lot of people uh and you can, you can start straight to cut and thrust, but I know there seems to be some kind of a stigma in some of the rapier community about that from the way it came about. So comments? Uh, so I'm a safety officer, so I don't know how much impact I can have on a, a cultural aspect from a, a safety perspective. Um, So if you want there to be more cut and thrust, go sponsor more cut and thrust tournaments or take your cut and thrust gear to places and show people how cool it is. Uh, and, you know, Aisha, I like doing cut and thrust with you too. And, and, and it's okay to continue to encourage people that start day one with cut and thrust. Yeah, if that's what people Absolutely, want. if that's what they're interested in. Okay. Uh, there okay, has, so. Go sorry. on. I was just gonna read. Real quick, this. apparently the shortened URL doesn't work for some reason, so I'm gonna put the full length URL in. We have uh, that should work for everybody on the cut and thrust topic. We had uh, Cope said, I'm not clear on which blades are permitted for which activities, rapier versus cut and thrust. Darius replied, All rapier blades are legal for cut and thrust, not all cut and thrust blades are rapier legal. Uh, and that there's a flexibility requirement for the cut and thrust that is more rigid, um, because of some of the expectations for those weapons, uh, and also some durability for how some of that combat can go not that it necessarily could or always does um so they only have a was it like a half inch i i'm not 100 percent up on the rules um yeah, a half correct. inch cut thrust is a half inch flex whereas rapier is a full inch flex yeah so there's some different uh, blade flexibility requirements there uh for cut and thrust there's also different protection required for elbows knees and hands so follow up on those rules it does require some slightly different equipment um, as far as protection the weapons can cross back and forth um, but check with your local group marshals and folks that are more into that they can uh, probably provide you some better more specific and easier to follow guidance than that and then uh ellis commented uh fighting in general is expensive i think that's on a list of of things that are are hard to do or are not great. Um, I agree, fighting is expensive. Um, that's uh, the nature of what we do. Uh, but swords are cool. Uh, I, if I have a choice between having some money or having a sword, I probably want to have a sword. Um, one, of the, <laughs> one of the things that um, Adam Komen and I had discussed a while ago is that we have sort of a generation of rapier fighters who maybe have more swords than they need. Um, like, we have swords that are still totally fine for fighting, but we've since bought swords that we prefer and use more often. So um, maybe talking to people about paring down our collections and making those available as loaner gear or selling them for, you know, very inexpensive to people who need them, um, taking a look at that. So that's something that can be further discussed. And then on this topic of, of swords, uh, I think Cope has a, a, a good point. She says she can read the armored rules. Um, and I think she's saying that she, they're, they're clear enough that she can understand that, but she's not confident by reading the, by reading the, the rules for cut and thrust about what weapons are, are good. Uh, so it's, uh, Dave, phrase that right, Cope? I think I, I think I got That's it. That's exactly correct. Yeah, I, I can make the armor, but I'm not buying, I'm not spending $300 on a sword, but I don't know it's good for cut and thrust or rapier. Um, so as Darius stated, all rapier blades are good for cut and thrust, but not all cut and thrust blades are good for rapier because they might have, they might be a, a higher rigidity. Um, most vendors will be able to tell you if they are valid for cut and thrust only or for rapier and cut and thrust. Um, so you should be able to ask that before purchasing. Um, but also there are a couple of members of our community who are very versed in cut and thrust blades and can probably recommend them to you. Um, for example, um, Tedesco out of the Chicago area, out of Midlands, very versed in cut and thrust. Um, Roland, are you able to recommend blades as well? 
I know you do a lot of cut and thrust. Yeah, and actually, that's what I had my hand raised for. If there's anybody on this who, as a marshal, is interested in cut and thrust, who needs more information about cut and thrust rules or culture, Master Tedesco is your one-stop shop. Uh, and if you don't know him, shoot me something in the chat. I'll get you my, uh, you know, Facebook, and we'll get that taken care of. Yeah, I know Raphael that was on here earlier is also very versed in it, but it looks like maybe oh, he has left. Yeah, uh, and as far as that goes, real quick, Cope, if you go to Purple Heart Armory, uh, woodenswords.com, they will tell you specifically what passes the SCA flex test. And by that, they mean the cut and thrust flex test. So anything you buy from Purple Heart will work for SCA cut and thrust. And then um, mirror by my follow-up question on this is, uh, I know that for other areas, the midroom has stricter rules. Are we stricter on our or rapier blades than society? Or are we as society minimum for, for weapons? I believe we follow society exactly. Is that correct, Darius? With the only exception of, I'd have to check the latest rules to see if they still allow um, foils and epes for some use in some kingdoms. Just for um, cut and thrust is oh, what I'm talking about. Oh, just for cut about. and thrust? Cut and thrust is pretty much standard across the board for yeah, society. We, we follow currently. society. Okay. So if, uh, if, yeah, it's a no more, no if it's a reputable vendor and they say they're SCA cut and thrust, then it should be a, a good sort of the mid room. Yeah. Yes. And, hey, Cope, um, I would throw out there that they said several times, and it's true, that all rapier blades are legal for cut and thrust. There's a lot of rapier blades that I would not want to use as my primary cut and thrust blade. Yeah, I think my rapier is kind of, I wouldn't want to take it out and cut and thrust. But I'm looking for a nice long sword and uh, I, I don't know what to buy. Yeah, the, that's one of those cases where the rules can give you sort of a maximum and a minimum, but it's much better to go to people with experience to tell you um, what you should be looking for. Yeah, I've, got, I've got a loaner blade we have that I won't let people use for cut and thrust because it's just going to break. <laughs> Uh, and then William Morris commented, Castile Armory classified blades by flex and use. Darkwood will custom make the flex you want or need. So those are also a couple other vendors to try. Um, does anybody else have any other questions or, or thoughts? Uh, um, I have a... Yeah, Thomas. Oh, <laughs> oh I'm not, I am not muted, sorry. Um, so in terms of marshalling, as opposed to the swords themselves, I've got. A, I'm running Grand Day in a month, and um, if I have cut and thrust people show up, I'm not cut and thrust authorized. Uh, do I need a cut and thrust marshal, or do I just need experience cut and thrust authorized people with a general marshal? That's something that was never clear to me. I was going to say I've heard this handled in different ways. Um, what's your take on it, Darius? So there is no longer a separate cut and thrust marshal versus. Uh, regular marshal for the most part if you are a or if you're a marshal and you have a cut and thrust authorization you can monitor that combat the same way you would be able to watch sword and dagger or anything else all right so but, while you specifically do not have a cut and thrust uh person at that point like you are you can't be that person because you don't have the authorization right. um the other people that show up so this goes back to part of the other <laughs> part but um we'll have to get approval for this but i would say that if you have two cut and thrust authorized people that are part of the combat and you have another marshal watching the combat that should be okay ideally you want a third person that is a com uh, a cut and thrust marshal but if the likelihood you're going to find three cut and thrust people that one or two of them aren't a marshal is pretty low Okay. Uh, statistically, I think like 97% or something of our cut and thrust populace is all martial. So um, you'll want to check to make sure that your paperwork is all uh, taken care of, but it shouldn't be a big deal. Okay. And it kind of wraps back to that first question on this call of ideally, it would be great to have a cut and thrust authorized person marshalling. Bare minimum, you should have a marshal watching. Okay. So if I get two cut and thrust people and they want to go play, as long as I have a, a, a marshal that I trust to watch them and they both appear to be competent cut and thrust 
authorized individuals uh, will be good. Well, one of them would have to be a, a, a cut and thrust authorized and, and a marshal to make it completely uh, that you have a marshal of that style present. Okay. But the likelihood that you're going to have two or three cut and thrust folks that you don't end up with a marshal is going to be fairly low. Excellent. Thank you, Edmund. Your grace. All right. So anybody else have a, a question? Or any thoughts? I have a general question about marshalling. Okay. I was I was told uh, that um, there's a practice in my locality that the marshal will not participate if there are only three fencers because Thrak and he's the only marshal. Thrak, yeah, I asked that question before you got oh. here. Cool. I Thank got you. the answer. Yeah, Thanks. I'll tell you later. Thank you. Uh, the the answer is um, ideally we have uh, three people so somebody can be watching. If it comes to a place where you only really have two fighters, we are going to trust that you're going to be safe. And uh, if it's truly only two fighters, that you're going to be in an area where you're not going to run into the populace, or you're not, or uh, by populace I mean the general public. Uh, and then you're going to try to find a place that's safe so you can can safely work. Um, and then Cope put in the the chat uh, about confused now you must have a marshally appropriate style present and Darius responded for cut and thrust yes there needs to be a marshal with a cut and thrust authorization um it's yeah cope uh i think the equivalent for on the armored side would be uh doing a melee with a combat archery you have to have a combat archery marshal it's a subset of uh an of a armored marshal um anybody else have any any questions or thoughts Uh, Isabel, you have any final thoughts or any final thoughts before we wind up? I appreciate you being on here. Um, I did want to comment on the plastic card issue, the laminated card. Um, I know some people had them from before the, um, the shutdown, and those cards were from the old database, and we've added and actually changed some of the authorization since then. So things are going to look different. Um, any of the new ones that were printed from the current database should have the current authorizations on them. And um, rather than an expiration date, they now say the printed on date. And I have asked um, all MOLs to accept the plastic cards as well. And um, I always ask MOLs from other kingdoms, to accept the database and the, any printed card, a copy, so you can print one out, you can make a copy of it so you don't have to take a phone or any electronic device. And none of them like that we don't have an expiration date, but the whole purpose of the electronic database was so that we could update it and no one ever expire. Um, and the printed on date is just to show that you're not using something that's like five years old, so that you're current. But, um, that's the only thing with the any of the cards that were printed before the shutdown is that uh, our styles have changed. We've added things okay. like spear. I don't believe rape your spear was done until after the after the shutdown. Right. Correct. And I don't know that it still is it in the database currently. Yes, I know it that it's being tracked. I just didn't know if it was it is visible. now. OK. Yep. Um, it was added to the new database that was just launched. Yeah, and I believe the new database also shows if you're a marshal. Yes. Yes, it does. I thought. Okay. Uh, Darius, do you have any final thoughts? No, I look forward to getting back to being a rapier participant and general marshal of the field. Great. Mirabai, any, any last thoughts? Um, I don't think so. Just if anyone has any questions for me, I'm easily reachable through Facebook or um, rapier at midrom.org. So feel free to reach out. Great, thank you. Uh, and I just wanna thank everybody for coming out. We're trying something new here. I appreciate all the questions and all the feedback. Uh, if you have any questions in the future, uh, you can reach out to myself or you can re reach out to Isabel uh, or Mirabai. Um, you should not reach out to Darius. He is now a, a private citizen. Um, <laughs> he may or may not answer you. <laughs> thank you for his service, uh, but it, um, I really appreciate everything that you guys all have done and I uh, hope you have a good evening. I'm gonna stop the recording. <laughs>